God is saying, do a fact versus truth checklist. And every time you do a fact versus truth checklist, you will see that I have won for you every single time. You got your heart broken and you're concerned about how you're going to view marriage going forward. Your heart is broken. That's a fact. But the truth is God is a healer. You, you lost your job and now you're concerned about how things are going to turn out. How are you going to tackle that, that pile of bills that's at home? The fact is you lost your job. The truth is, God is a way maker and he is a provider and he's going to set you up for something better than you could have imagined before. You've got to do a fact versus truth checklist. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you. Thank you for right now, God, this precious moment that we have, Lord, to receive everything that you have for us, oh God. Yes, Lord God, how appropriate, Lord. The children are now away, God, and mommy and grandma and auntie and mentor and cousin and whoever can just sit and hear your voice. So have thine own way today, Lord. May we be engaged, equipped, empowered, and encouraged by this word to do your will on this earth. Have thine own way. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Now, opening scripture is coming out of James chapter 1, verse 6. And it reads this. It says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. I just want you to lay your hand on your heart this morning over there online and here, here in the house. Say, Lord, I believe. Help my own belief. You can be seated in his presence. Opening, opening verse says, when you ask, you must believe. Somebody said, you must believe. You must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind lord have mercy that is not a good look for anybody that is struggling to believe or struggling with with doubt you know i just just a, a quick story um me and my, my brother uh my dad back in the 80s he used to have his basement set up and it was, I mean, it was really nice. When I look back at it now, it was like that was the man, his man cave. He had his stereo system. He had a bar with all his nice wines and all his liqueurs and all this other stuff. But as much as my dad designed this to be his man cave, for whatever reason, it also became my brother and I, it was our soccer field. And, and so my brother, and I look back at it and I'm like, what, what was I doing? And me and my brother would go down there and we would play soccer, but we would play soccer like we were playing for the U.S. Cup. We were kicking that ball. I had no regard for what was in the room. I didn't care about drywall. When I look back at that, I was C-O-T-R all in. I was all in. I was kicking that ball with everything I had. Now, of course, when you're doing that and you've got a nice, you know, a bar section that my dad had down there with all his liqueurs and all his wines and all his glasses and it was this great display, I'm kicking that ball. We kicked that ball straight to that bar, and it shattered. I mean, there were wine glasses. There was, there was wine all over. It shattered in a million pieces. Now my brother and I are looking at each other like, I can't believe that happened. <laughs> it makes no sense. Now that I'm an adult, I'm like, why didn't I think that was, that's what was going to happen? But we were just so surprised that we just completely demolished my dad's bar that he had downstairs. And so now my brother and I had gotten many a whooping for lying. We talked about, Pastor Kears talked about today. You will get, if you love them, and I got to say this and make sure that I'm clear because I'll get an email. All I'm saying is if you love that child, right, I'm not saying beat them. I'm saying don't spare the rod. Spank that child if they need a spanking. And so I'll get into that a little bit later. But, but my brother and I knew that when, when, when my dad got home, we were going to get whooping. Because we, we lied 
often. And if there's one thing that my parents could not stand, they would not tolerate, is lying. And so my brother and I went back and forth after we shattered my dad's bar. I looked at him, he looked at me, and I said right away, listen, remember what, what, what mom said? Remember what dad said? We got to tell the truth. And my brother says, yeah, I hear you. We got to tell the truth, but this ain't going to turn out good. What do you, and I looked at him and said, what do you mean? I mean, they said to tell the truth, and as long as we tell the truth, everything should be all right. My brother said, you don't understand. I don't think you get it. Yes, yeah, we, we got to tell the truth, but we need to get ready because there's going to be consequences and repercussions. And, and, and so we're going back and forth in the basement, and then finally my brother looks at me and he says, all right, let's go. Let's go tell the truth, but I'm telling you what's going to happen. So I go upstairs. I don't know if my mother remembers this, but I went upstairs to my mother, and I said, Mama, she said, yes, yeah, son. I said, me and Mikey were downstairs and we were playing in the basement and we broke all of dad's uh, uh, glasses and wine glasses and wine bottles. Okay, see ya. <laughs> and I was waiting because, you know, I was told, tell, tell the truth and, you know, just make sure you tell the truth. And so my brother is sitting about, maybe about six feet back, this is before COVID, this is six feet back, and he's like, and so I, I said this to my mother and my mother said the dreaded words, I did not want to hear. She looked at me and she said, son, wait till your father gets home. <laughs> and here's the bad part about waiting until your father gets home. Cause now you gotta wait for your father to get home, right? And so, and so mom didn't call him at work and let him know what happened to all the, the, the wine and his wine glasses. So dad had to, regardless of how his day was, dad had to come home to this. And so my prayer was that Lord, let him have had the best possible day he could have possibly had. I don't want this to be the straw that breaks the camel's back or mine. And so I said, and so I said, I, I began to pray and I'm nervous. And the whole day, the whole day, my stomach is turning. I'm nervous and so sure enough my dad gets home and so I try it again I said well I'm a dad said tell the truth so I'm gonna tell the truth and maybe maybe that'll get me off I said dad I just want to let you know um how was your day <laughs> had a good day son that that's good I just want to let you know me and me and Mikey were downstairs and, and we broke all of your wine bottles and all your wine glasses. Okay, see you, Dad. I'll see you later. Oh, no, 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 no. It was kind let me Let me tell you this. Now, what I had, I had hoped, right? And here's what my, my hope and my expectations were. My hope and my expectations were my dad would say, thank you, son, for telling the truth. Go on outside, and I'll call you when it's time for dinner. <laughs> That's not what happened. My, the, the, the reality is, in love, somebody say, in love, in love, my dad whooped my behind. Now, now watch this. Me and Pastor Kears laugh about this sometimes. Pastor Kears says that his mother was, was what, a one word whooper? She would whoop with each word? Well, my dad, my dad would whoop with each syllable. <laughs> and he had long, big vocabulary. And every syllable was a, was a spanking. Somebody said, well, how do you raise a pastor? Tell him, mama, whoop his <laughs> I want to say this too as a disclaimer because some of y'all looking at me like oh, oh, the child. Yes. Spank that little behind. And here's and here's my advice. And this is not part of my word, but I'm, I'm giving y'all this for free. This is for free. This is for free. The reality is, and I can I can hide behind the word on that. It's scriptural to discipline your child. Now, here's how you do it. Here's how you do it. You have to make sure that if you're going to spank your child, you spank your child before you get angry. Hallelujah. If you're spanking your child out of anger, that goes from discipline to abuse. Before you get angry angry. And here's the second thing, and then we're going to move. You make sure that after you give that child a spanking, then you sit down with them after, the <laughs> <laughs> after they've done all of that, then you sit and you ask them, do you understand why you got a spanking? This is a super important conversation to have, and I'm telling you, if you have this conversation and you are led by the Lord and you're spanking, you give them Holy Spirit whoopings, the child will understand the child will understand why they got a spanking. 
I had, now my daughters, I got to stop. They're at the age now where they realize their examples in my sermons. So this might be my last one. But I had my daughter come to me. I lied to you not. She came to me one day. This is her first year in public school. And she came to me and she saw how the other children were acting in her classroom. I, take the mic if I'm lying. My, my daughter came home to me and she said, Dad. I said, what's up, baby? She said, thank you. I said, for what? Thank you for spanking me. Thank you for speaking to me. Dad. I said, why in the world are you saying that? She said, because I see the way some of my friends act, and I could tell they have no concern. Like, they're not going to get anything when they get home. And I just thank you because I'm so glad I don't act like that. And so I say that in, in love. I say that in love. That's your Mother's Day gift, mamas. If you ain't been spanking, that's your Mother's Day gift. You go ahead, now you know how to spank. Praise the Lord. <laughs> now, check this out. When my brother and I were arguing in the basement or whether, you know, after we broke the wine glasses, we were not arguing about, you know, telling the truth. We knew that telling the truth was the right thing to do. The argument was whether or not there would be significant consequences for our actions. My brother understood telling the truth is the right thing to do, but it doesn't mean that they're not going to be consequences. This is what makes it corrective behavior is that you learn what not to do next time so that you are, are flying in the straight and narrow. My brother was right. You know, we told my mother and she said those dreaded words, wait till your father get home. You see, my brother knew my mom and dad a little better than I did at the time. And as a result, he had more, here's the word, healthy expectations. Somebody say healthy expectations. My expectations were lofty. My expectations were off. And so with every whooping, I just looked more and more confused. Like, why is this happening? Because my expectations, <laughs> my expectations were off. They were too lofty. And if I wasn't careful, I'd mess around and be mad at my father for spanking me. Not because he was doing the wrong thing, but because my expectations... We're off. I could be mad at my mama. Mama, why you had to tell daddy? Why you had to tell him that? Why we couldn't keep this between me and you? That would have been false and bad expect expectations. Listen, oftentimes, as it pertains to our relationship with God, the people that struggle with doubt the most are those that often have flawed expectations. I need you to understand, if you're taking notes this morning, the word this morning is called dealing with doubt. Dealing with doubt. Oftentimes, you have struggles with your doubt because you have flawed expectation. Not that you don't believe that God exists and that God is real. Yeah, you, you believe that, but you still struggle with doubt. And a lot of times it's because your expectations are flawed. Listen, the reality is a breeding ground for doubt is not always lack of faith, but ignorance. A breeding ground for doubt is not always lack of faith. You, you believe him and you believe he exists, but you're not quite, you're, you're ignorant to the, to the attributes and the qualities of God. It's just like me and my expectations of, of my dad after I broke his bar in two. This is the reality. It, is, it was ignorance that, that caused me to have those false expectations. You see, if we don't know God, we will be disappointed in his responses to us because of our flawed expectations. And as a result, doubt creeps in. There are some of you who believe you got to be careful that God is a genie in the bottle. And you would never dare say that to another brother or sister in Christ. Well, God is my genie and I'll rub the lamp and I will make my three wishes. And if it doesn't happen the way I think it's going to happen, then something, it's not something wrong with me. Something is wrong with him. And if things don't turn out the way we want them to turn out because of our flawed expectations, now we have an issue with God when all God was doing was being who he is. We have to be careful about having flawed expectations of God because God is not going to bend to the shape that you want him to bend into. He is sovereign. He is mighty. He is powerful. He is God all by himself. He doesn't have to bend to your will. You have to bend to his. And the problem is when he doesn't, 
then you, if we're not careful, we'll say to ourselves, well, God must not be who, who he said he was because he let me down. No, your flawed expectations, they let you down. The breeding ground for doubt is always a lack, is not always a lack of faith, but, but ignorance. Listen, I find that for many of us, the issue of doubt is, is, is more about not getting what we want than it is about doubting his existence. Check this out. Believe it or not, one of the signs that you are a growing Christian, one of the signs that you are moving forward and you're growing in your spiritual maturity is when you are able to recognize that you have doubts. The biggest mistake that you can make is to try to act like you don't have any doubts whatsoever and you are 100% filled to the brim with nothing else. And certainly doubt is not one of the things you are, you are filled with. As a growing Christian, you are willing to say, you know what, Lord? I'm in this situation, I'm in this circumstance, but, but I'm having a hard time with my doubt right now. I'm having a hard time really believing that this is going to work out for your glory. If, I, if I'm being honest, if I'm being real, if I'm being real, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a little bit doubtful that you're going to come through in the way that I need you to come through. Is anybody, has everybody ever been there in your life? You can just kind of wave. You might be afraid to just put your hand up. But, but okay, so I know that I'm talking to, to the right folks. And the, the rest of y'all, I'm going to pray for you or we need to have a conversation because I need to know what you're doing. There's sometimes doubt that creeps in. This is just the reality. It creeps in at times. And that's one of the signs of being a grown Christian is when you're willing to say, you know what, Lord, I'm struggling with doubt in this area. I've seen you heal people in my family, but I'm struggling to believe that you can really reach my wife's heart the way I need you to reach her heart. Or I'm struggling to believe that you can really break through in my finances. I've seen, I've seen what you did in people's lives around me, but I don't know if you can handle that mountain of bills. I don't know if you can handle that. And that's a sign of maturity when you're able to come to God. In all honesty, this is one of the things that God loved about David. Understand this. David was an extremely flawed individual. Please don't put him on a pedestal that you ought not to put him on. Read your Bible. D David did some stuff. But the reality is every time that David did something, you can read in the next scripture, he came and he had a repentant heart. And he was able to hear when Nathan came and said, listen, you did wrong. David repented right away. He didn't have false expectations of who God was. And so that's one of the things that you can do as a Christian is be real with God. I'm struggling with doubt in this area. I know I've been saved for 15 years, for 20 years, for 30 years, and I'm believing that for some of you, that's the clock that's in the line. You're trying to wonder, you're wondering why your breakthrough hasn't come in this particular area, and God is holding it up because you are not being completely real with him. If you would just admit and let me all the way in, admit that you're struggling with doubt in this area, I can show my glory off in your life, but I need you to just meet me halfway. Can we have a real conversation this morning? Be real with God and tell him you've got some doubts. Listen, a growing Christian, you come to a place where you acknowledge that your doubt exists. And you don't just acknowledge that your doubt exists. You acknowledge that your doubt exists and you bring it to the Lord. Because God doesn't want you sleeping with that doubt. God doesn't want you, you carrying the weight of that doubt all throughout your life. God is saying, come on, cast all your cares upon me. Can we have a conversation about what you're struggling with? Acknowledge that your doubt exists and bring it to the Lord. Believing in the power of God and wanting to believe in the power of God are two different things with two different levels of power. I want to repeat that. I want to repeat that. Believing in the power of God and wanting to believe in the power of God are two different things with two different levels of power. Bring your struggles with doubt to God. He knows they're there. Stop pretending that you believe. You're going in circles. Listen, watch this. The one who wants to believe, they might experience a miracle in their lifetime. But the one who does performs them. I'll say it to this side and make sure y'all get it too. The one who wants to believe may experience a miracle, some kind of breakthrough, a miracle in their lifetime. But the one who truly does believe is the one who performs them. 
This is the reality. So you've got to bring it to, to God. He knows how to deal with your doubts. In Mark chapter 9, verse 23 through 25, it reads this. It says, Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out, and this, this, this child was, was demonically possessed. The, the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Wow. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. This man experienced the miracle because he was real. Somebody say he was real. Now he's standing in front of Jesus. This is Jesus. This is no, no time to play or time to act, act like he's got it all together. He's in desperate need. He wants his son to be freed from what has held him captive. And so in this moment, it's like I'm, I'm not playing any games. And Jesus says to him, if you can believe, all things are possible. And then he says, Lord, I believe. But can I be real with you for a second, Jesus? Lord, help me. In my belief, here's what's beautiful about what he just said. He believes in Jesus enough to know that he can help him where he struggles to believe. That's a good level of faith. I, I believe in you enough to know that you can help me when I struggle to believe. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. This man experienced the miracle because he wanted to believe. Acts chapter 19, verse 11 through 12, it says this. It says, God, now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of him. Understand this. This is, this is a high level of anointing. Paul was able to heal, not just because he wanted to believe, but because he did. The one who, who, who wants to believe will experience a miracle. The one who does is the one who will perform them. Understand this. Understand that is the reality. So number one, acknowledge that your doubt exists. Somebody say, and bring it to God. Bring it to God. Number two, I want to say this. Pray, read, and get to know God. And he will help you discover things that stir your faith. Pray and read and learn about your God. And he will help you discover things that stir your faith. Understand this. Like I said, God knows when you're struggling with your faith. And so he says, I just need you to seek me. I need you to seek me in my word. I need you to seek me where I am. And as you seek me, I'm going to show you. I'm going to prove to you that I am who I said I am. And it's all in the word. You don't have to make anything up. You don't have to start freestyle. It is all right there in the word. God will show you. I have some scriptures that, that I have in my heart that, that I'm going to go over with you in a second. I call them proof scriptures. I mean, all scriptures are proof scriptures, but there are some scriptures that I look at and I'm like, God, you are just showing off with that one. I love this. But, but, but understand this before we get to that. When you are struggling, Pray, read, and seek God, and you'll discover things that stir your faith. Here's one of the things that God wants to do to help you stir your faith is to do a fact and a truth checklist. Somebody say this. There is a difference between the fact and the truth. And so when you are struggling to believe, God is saying do a fact versus truth checklist and every time you do a fact versus truth checklist you will see that i have won for you every single time you got your heart broken that boy or that girl they broke your heart and you're concerned about how you're going to view marriage going forward and you're crying and you're broken your heart is broken that's a fact but the truth is god is a healer you, you lost your job, and now you're concerned about how things are going to turn out. How are you going to tackle that, that pile of bills that's at home? The fact is, you lost your job. The truth is, God is a way maker, and he is a provider, and he's going to set you up for something better than you could have imagined before. You've got to do a fact versus truth checklist time and time and time again you will see if you compare the facts with the truth you will see that God wins every time our struggle sometimes is that we're too factual we're fact-based fact will drive you absolutely nuts 
if you're not careful. Because facts have a way that they, that they, they can, can put roots into your mind because there's a reality about them. But you've got to understand that there are two realities that you can focus on. Yes, fact is a reality, but there's a greater reality that God overcomes and has made you more than an overcomer. So regardless of how scary that fact is, there is a truth that can destroy it every single time. Fact versus truth. Do a fact versus truth checklist, and you will find, regardless of the facts that have mounted up against you, there is a truth that destroys it every single time, a truth in God's word. Understand this. When we go through times of doubt, we need to make sure that we are as critical of our doubts as our doubts are on our faith. Be as critical when those doubts rise up. Be as critical about those doubts as your doubts are critical to your faith. So every time your, your doubt says, well, what about this? What about that? How you going to pay that bill? How you going to figure this one out? How you going to stop them from saying that? How you going to stop this, that, and the other? Every time those doubts start creeping in, you need to combat all of those doubts and be as critical as those doubts are that, that are rising up against your faith, and you be critical of those doubts. And so every time those doubts say, well, how you going to do this? How you going to do that? How you going to figure it out? Your response is, my God, my God, my God. I don't know doubt where you're coming from, but I'm critical of the doubt that is rising up in me. So you're going to have to go somewhere. I recognize what the facts are, but I rest in the truth of God's word. Every time that doubt rises up, you fight it with the word of God. Be critical of your doubts. Stop looking at your doubts as though they are, they are grounded in truth because oftentimes they are not. Be critical. Somebody say, be critical of your doubts. Stop letting your doubts rent so much space in your head. It's time for an eviction notice. Doubt, you got to go. You can't live here anymore. You're taking up too much of my resources, too much of my time. Doubt, you're going to have to go. Be critical of your doubts. Stop believing your doubts are the truth because they're not. Do not let your doubts run you. Watch this. Number three, look at God's track record. You forget all this. You say, well, well, Pastor Jason said something about fact and truth. And, 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 then, and then he was saying something about re reading his word and, and, and recognize. Okay, if you can't remember any of that, I need you to remember this. Remember this. I just need you to go back. Look through, the, through your life. And don't look through your life from your perspective. Because how many know that your perspective can mess some stuff up? The way you see things can make things look real crazy. But you, but you see things through the eyes of God. I believe that's some of what happened to Paul as he was walking down the road. He, he, he got blinded and he couldn't see anything. And then when God was ready for him to see again, it says something like scales fell off of his eyes. For a long time, Paul was seeing the world and he was seeing Christians from his own fleshly viewpoint. But God had to help him to see things from his eyes. And so sometimes you need to turn back the pages of your life and take a look at your life and see it through God's eyes because there are some things that, that have happened to you in your life that you felt was a failure but if you look at it through Christ's eyes you see that it wasn't a setback it was a setup it was something that God was setting you up for to put you to the next place that God has for you but you've got to recognize that it's all about your perspective if your perspective is off all you're going to feel like is losing losing all I've done all my life is lose 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 and God is saying, I need you to see life from my perspective. If you turn back the pages of your life, you will see in all of your difficult moments, you will see that God kept you. In your difficult moments, he kept you. When you feel like you couldn't go another day, he carried you. When you were weak, it was an opportunity for his strength to be made perfect. When you thought you were winning, God showed you, well, you know, I got to show you something else. I got I to gotta show you what really, really winning looks like. And so all the things that have happened in your life, if you see it from God's perspective, you will recognize that he has not lost a single battle in your life. Not the ones that you gave, not the ones that you gave to him completely. Now, there are some things that we held to ourselves. We said we're going to be real this morning. Some battles that you said, you know what, I'm going to work this thing out myself because I'm afraid, God, if I give it to you, you're going to take too long. Or, or, or you're going to let them off because you know you got a grace. And so you're not going to get them the way I would get them. 
so you hold on to it. And in those situations, we make it worse than it needed to be. But every battle that you've given to God, go back. Now you don't got to do it now, but in your free time, go back and say, oh, my gosh, I thought I lost that. But God, if that didn't happen, then this wouldn't have happened, and that wouldn't have happened, and I wouldn't have ended up in the place that I am right now. He hasn't lost. Somebody say, he never lost. He never lost the battle. Now watch this. I said there are some scriptures that I call proof scriptures. And in, in any, any moment where doubt starts to creep in, I go to the word and I read what I like to call, this is just my thing, I like to call them proof scriptures. You see, proof scriptures are those scriptures that are so clearly God-inspired that no one is able to refute or disprove the existence of its wisdom and its knowledge. Now, that's all scriptures, but for whatever reason, this scripture just, these come out to me. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 22. I love these scriptures because it just, it just, it just laughs in the face of the, of the doubters and the haters. Jeremiah 33, 22 says, I will make the descendants of David my servant and the Levites who minister before me, watch this, as countless as the stars in the sky and as measureless as the sand on the seashores. Okay, as countless as the stars in the sky. Well, you may look at me and say, well, why, how is that a proof scripture? Why is that, why is that a big deal? Well, because you, you, you're reading it with the knowledge that you have now. You've got to understand that, that when this scripture was breathed and when this scripture was told and when this scripture was written by, by the scribes, there were people who believed and it was a popular belief that you can count the stars. It was a popular belief that there is a limited number of stars in the universe. And there were those who studied, you know, astronomy, the, the, those who studied the stars and studied the skies. And they say, listen, th theoretically speaking, you can look at this and you can count. And we think there are about a million stars. And then some years pass by and they realize, no, nah, it's actually 50 million stars. And then some years pass by and they researched and said, actually, no, nah, it's more like a billion stars. And then in, in technological advancement, we've got all these Hubble telescopes and we can see in galaxies far away and we realize, you know what, we were wrong about the 50 billion stars. The reality is, with all the advancement in technology, we've come to realize you can't count. Not only can you not count the stars because they're innumerable, but you can't even count the galaxies. I can't even count the galaxies that have billions and billions of stars inside of them. And, and so this is where we're coming. We're coming to this conclusion just now. But it's said in the word. In the beginning there was the word and the word was God. Jeremiah 33, 22, it says as countless as the stars. God knew. I know what they think. They can count the stars. I'm telling you, you can't because I created it. There is no limit to the number of stars and so will be your descendants. It's a proof. Proof scripture. Now watch this. Watch this. After, after scientists discovered that stars were innumerable, they said, okay, you know what, you were right. With all of our advancements in technology, with everything that we have, we realize, you know what, that, that, that stars can't be counted. You were right about that. But they're all the same. All stars. If you look up in, in the sky at night, yeah, some are a little bigger than others, but they're all pretty much the same. They all twinkle just about the same. And God says, no. No, 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 no. Let's go to Colossians chapter 15, verse 41, and it reads this. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another. And star differs from star in splendor. And you know what that scientists discovered today? What they realized? You know what? I know we thought all stars were just about the same and the same size and the twinkle just about the same. But you know what? You know, we got these advances in te te technology. You know, we realized, you know, we realized every star is different. There is no star that is exactly the same. Now, they could have gone to 1 Corinthians 15, 41 and found that out a long time ago. Why? Because our God said so in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God and these are things that I don't know about you in my moments where I'm having a hard time can I can I be real as your pastor I know I'm supposed to stand up here and say I never have doubts never <laughs> what God gonna do it no I'm not gonna do that I'm gonna tell you the truth there are times where I struggle with doubt. I don't let it win, but I struggle 
There are some things I've seen and some things that I have been up against where I'm like, God, I don't know how you're going to do this thing. What is that? That's doubt. When you say, I don't know how you're going to do this. In other words, God, I don't know. I don't see you do some stuff, but God, I don't know. That is doubt. And so God says, son, come on back to my word. Remember, remember what I told you when they doubted the number of stars. Remember when I told you when they doubted that they were all, they all shined in different ways. Listen, don't doubt me now. I'm dealing with your doubt. I'm dealing with your doubt. Now watch this, and we're going to wrap up. We're going to wrap up with this. You, you must realize that oftentimes doubt tries to hit us hardest right before the breakthrough. Right before God is getting ready to break through everything. This is why people get so frustrated because you always hear pastors saying, get ready, your, your breakthrough is coming. Your breakthrough is coming. Well, how long is my breakthrough going to be coming? How long is my breakthrough going to be coming? Some people have been hearing that for decades. And their breakthrough still isn't here. And I'm not saying it's not because your breakthrough is coming, but a lot of times that pastor, that preacher, he was right. But right before your breakthrough, you took about three steps back because doubt crept in. And then you got right, then you got right, and then you, then you push forward and you push forward and you push forward. And then, and then right before your breakthrough, you say, you know what, this is taking too long. And then you went off with so-and-so. You went off with that girl. You went off with that guy. And, you, and then right there, and it delayed what God wanted to do due to your disobedience. It's quiet in here. And so the preacher, the pastor, and the word of God is in line when it says your breakthrough is coming. Your breakthrough is coming. Do not grow weary in good doing. Listen, keep on pressing because the reality is that doubt often tries to hit us hardest just before the breakthrough. When this happens, listen, I've seen my beautiful, precious, gorgeous, anointed, wonderful wife. I have seen her birth four beautiful children. Now, let me tell you, she handled it like, I mean, by the fourth one, by the fourth one, it was like, all right, let's go. <laughs> but... There are moments right toward the end where my wife has looked at me and said, baby, you got to, something got to give. Something, I, I, don't, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to carry this child. We got to figure something out. Lord, come on now. Right before the water breaks, she's right there where she's like, I have had a, you got to come out of me now. <laughs> it was cute in the beginning. Right before Right before the breakthrough, there were many times people grew weary and doubted God just before he blessed them with what they asked or hoped for. You don't believe me. We're in good company. Let's go to John chapter 20, verse 11 through 16. John chapter 20, verse 11, it says, now Mary stood outside the tomb. Y'all remember this? Stood outside the tomb crying, crying. Now, now I want to pause right there. We're on this side of the resurrection. We can read that scripture and be like, man, I, I wouldn't have been crying. I would have been like, all right, Lord, come on, day three. We're going to celebrate because he's getting ready to come out of the grave. But what is Mary dealing with right here? Is he who he said he was? We're about to find out. I hope he is. I hope this is it. But she's crying because she's warring on the inside. What she knows, the fact is she saw her Savior crucified and deal a bloody and horrific and inconvenient death. And that's as far up to this point as the story has gone. And so she's before the tomb and she's weeping because she's like, Lord, that was a horrific death. I don't know how someone can come back dealing with doubt. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken, look at her answer, they have taken my Lord away. Come on, how many of y'all know that's doubt? Is she so full of doubt right now that Jesus is gone, he's no longer in the tomb, and she's come up with a reason that's not the real reason, but the reason for why he's gone. He couldn't have raised, risen from the dead, so somebody must have taken his body. Doubt has gripped her. They have taken my Lord away. She says, now you got to understand this. 
Watch, watch who's getting ready to talk to her. She said, and I don't know where they have put him. I don't know where they have put him. Come on, let's go to the next verse. It says, at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. Watch this. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. There are some of you in a situation where God has been calling you. God has been calling your name. God is saying, listen, your breakthrough is here. But you can't see it because you are so consumed in your doubt. She didn't even realize it was Jesus calling her from a resurrected grave. It says, and she didn't know it was him. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? That's the second time they asked. First the angels asked. And now Jesus is asking, why are you you crying in other words why are you doubting why are you doubting i told you this was the case who is it you are looking for thinking he was the gardener she said sir if you have carried him talking to the resurrected jesus still consumed in doubt thinking he was the gardener she said sir if you have carried him away tell me where you have put him and i'll go get him jesus said to her mary she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbanai, which means, which means teacher. She was so consumed, sitting at the tomb of the risen Savior. Y'all got to understand this. At this point in scripture, he was already risen. He was already up and out of the grave. And she hadn't even recognized it because she was so preoccupied with doubt that she didn't even recognize a resurrected savior when he said her name. How many times have we struggled with doubt to the point where we couldn't hear nothing about the blessing because the doubt was just so real? It blocked our view. Every time we try to behold the glory of God, yeah, but what about this? Yeah, but what about, what about, what about? To the point where Jesus taps you on the shoulder and says, son, I'm with you and I'm for you. Who are you and what have you done with my breakthrough? Luke chapter 1, verse 11 through 20. It says this. Y'all remember this? Then an angel of the Lord appeared. This is to Zacharias. Appeared to Zacharias and standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Next verse. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. The prayer for the gift of a son has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. And you are to call him John, that being John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. I want to read that again because I think people underestimate how powerful that is. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Even before he is born, even before Jesus is crucified, that's another class for another day, he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. Somebody say, man, this is good news. You would think Zechariah would be like, oh my God, not only am I getting ready to have a son, but he's going to do all of this. Now, this isn't just some Joe Schmo that showed up and said, hey, man, your son going to do some, he's going to be, man, listen. He's going to change the world. This is an angel of the Lord. And is telling him this word for word. Somebody say again, this is good news. Luke chapter 1 verse 17. And he will go on before the Lord. It keeps going. In the spirit and power of Elijah. To turn the hearts of parents to their children. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Oh my gosh. Zechariah asked the angel. Zechariah asked the angel, or, uh, how, how can I be, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old, there it is, fact versus truth, fact versus truth. He's looking the angel right in the eyes and all he can see. I am an old man and my wife is well along in her years. The angel said to him, I 
am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news and you talking nonsense. <laughs> and now you will be silent. Now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their appointed time. I want to let you know this morning, some of you, your words are getting in the way of what God is trying to do. You've been struggling with doubt and God is getting ready to break through in your life but you keep opening your mouth and I'm telling you that your words have power and the more you speak, the more you are hindering what God is trying to do in your life. Some of y'all need to just cover your mouth. Lord, I don't know how you're going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but Lord, but I don't know. <laughs> you laugh. I've gotten in the habit of doing this. I'm not. Because if I open my mouth, I'm going to mess it up. This mouth is operating out of the flesh right now. Shut up. Shut up. I can tell myself to shut up. Don't y'all look at me like that. Some of y'all need it. Remember when your child, we were talking about spanking, oh, your child was acting up, you give him a quick pop and mouth, real quick. That's what you need to do to yourself. I'm not, I'm going, I'm getting ready to mess. Well, how can I be married? And I'm, I'm getting ready to be 52 years old. And, I know, and then your soon to be husband here, you talking nonsense and walk right by you. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I need a woman of faith. How? How can I have, have a child? And I, it's Mother's Day, and I see so many mothers, and, I, and I've been struggling. And I, you know, but I know, you know, Lord, that you, I feel like you spoke to my heart, and you said that I would, I would have a child, but I'm concerned. I don't want to go back into trying because you know what happened last time. And. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> God is saying, I'm going to open your womb. I'm going to open your womb. But you're getting ready to mess it up. you got to understand this. This is how powerful. I know we always hear, we don't want to make it cliche, but we always hear there's power. There's death and life in the tongue. And it says death first because we often, uh, this tongue is flesh, and so we tend to speak doubt first. But you got to think about how powerful our words must be. If the angel Gabriel had to shut Zechariah's mouth before he said another word. It makes me ask the question, what if he let Zechariah continue to talk? What if the angel Gabriel said, you know what, Zechariah, go ahead, I want to hear all of what you're about to say. And he probably would have went on and on and on. It ain't going to happen because, you know, last time I had gone to the doctor, they had said, you know, my count was kind of low. And I ain't tell nobody. And then sister girl, you know, she been feeling kind of way about me. So we ain't really, you know, been connecting like that. Long. And Gabriel just sitting there like, I done, the Lord done sent me down here to hear this nonsense. What would have happened if he just let Zechariah keep talking? I believe because there is so much power, there is so much power in our words. And it, it, it hasn't happened, so I don't know. But I believe that, that, that Gabriel would have been like, okay, Lord, are you sure this might not be the one? This might not be the one because John going to be born and he's still going to be speaking this nonsense all around this child. And it's going to be affecting the promise that John. He might just mess up what God is trying to do. So you're going to have to be quiet for a season until the breakthrough comes. Somebody ought to say, learn to be quiet. And I'm giving you permission to say this. Say doubt. Shut up. God is getting ready to move. God had to shut Zechariah's mouth because his doubt was going to mess him up just before the breakthrough. I want you to stand to your feet this morning. I don't know what you need to shut up about. I don't know what it is. I'm not going to get all in your business. But I do know this. God has been wanting to move mightily in your life. But this stupid doubt, it keeps getting in the way of your willingness to allow God to move mountains in your life. God, can you really move mountains? I mean, really? Because 
I don't know about you, I've never seen a mountain move before, so our, uh, <laughs> either he's a liar or he is who he says he is. You've never seen a mountain move, huh? How big was that cancer that you thought couldn't be healed from? Seemed like a mountain when you got the diagnosis, didn't it? How big was that issue in your marriage that you said, we're not overcoming this, we're just going to have to call it quits? How big was your anger and your frustration? Seemed like a mountain, didn't it? But now you can look into the eyes of your spouse and say, man, if we can overcome that, we can overcome anything. I move that for you. Maybe you're here today, this morning, and if you're being real with yourself, you realize I've been struggling been struggling with, with doubt. And you heard me, heard me say that it's right before the breakthrough that doubt comes with this biggest haymaker, biggest blow. It comes right, right, right at the point of your breakthrough. I'm telling you right now, God has carried you this far. He's carried you this far. We used to sing that song, come this far by faith. Leaning, leaning on the Lord. God is saying, I've got so much for you. I've got a plan and a purpose and a promise for you. And I just need you to not doubt me now. Remember when you believed me before? You believed me in the little things. Now I need you to believe me in the big things. I, I know you believed me for somebody else. And, and you saw me move in somebody else's life. But for whatever reason, you keep, keep disqualifying yourself. I'm just saying to you, child of God, don't doubt me now. Don't doubt me now. Don't doubt me now. Don't doubt me for their job. Don't doubt me for your community. Don't doubt me. For the salvation of your loved one, don't doubt me now. Don't doubt me now. I know you want to doubt. Tell that doubt to shut up. Don't doubt me. Don't doubt me now. Don't doubt me now. Don't doubt me now. It's the one thing that's stopping you. It's the one thing that is preventing me from allowing you to walk. Put your foot in the water and see it part. Don't doubt me now. Remember when Moses, the, 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 uh, uh, the cherubs, uh, not the cherubs, but the Pharaoh was coming behind him and the sea was in front of him and the people were murmuring saying well what are we going to do now Moses what are we going to do now we got out of, out, of, out of Egypt but now we're going to die out here in the wilderness what are we going to do now and then Moses goes to the Lord and he says the Lord in so many words what am I supposed to do you know what God's response was why are you talking to me some of y'all would get offended if the Lord said that to you why are you talking to me he said, stretch your, stretch your staff out or use what I've already given you. And he stretched it out and the sea parted so that there was a wall on both sides and they were able to walk by on dry ground. Some of y'all right now are, are, are murmuring. You're standing before your sea and you feel like your past is chasing you from behind and you're looking at God saying, what am I supposed to do? God is saying, I've been for you all these years. Why would I fail you now? We just sang about it this morning. I never let you down. Time after time I've been with you and for you when you thought you were by yourself. Self. I showed up for you like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Look into the fire. There's another one in there with them. I've been with you in your heartache and your pain. In your heartache and your pain when you thought your father left you for dead. When you thought your mother left you for dead. I was with you in the moment when you felt like an orphan. I was with you. And I've carried you, and I won't fail you now. When they were making fun of you in grade school, and they made you feel like less of a person, and, and they bullied you to the point where you were concerned about living life. You didn't even want to live life. I was with you to comfort you. You think you made it by yourself? And so now, I'm bringing you to another level in life. Don't doubt me now. I know what the doctor said. I know, I know what the prognosis is, and thank God for the doctors. They're doing their job. They've got to tell you about the science, but understand that I invented science. I'm behind the whole thing. I just need you. I just, you're, you're more concerned about that which is infecting you, but you're truly infected with is doubt. Is doubt. Every head bowed and every eye closed. The Lord is saying, don't doubt me now.
don't doubt me now. Don't doubt me now. I know it seems like you can't overcome this thing, but don't, don't doubt me now. I'm dealing with, I'm dealing with your doubt. I'm dealing, I'm dealing with your doubt. I'm dealing with your doubt. I'm dealing with your doubt. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. In other words, Lord, I believe in you enough to know that you can handle my doubt. Somebody say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. If you're here this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed, and you've been struggling with doubt because of what life has shown you, but today you're seeing it from God's perspective, and you realize today that the way you've been seeing life is flawed. If you see it from God's perspective, you will see that in your weakness, he carried you. In your loneliness, he was there with you. In the darkness, he was the shining light. In the chaos, he was your peace. You're so mad about the chaos that you didn't realize that he was the peace in the midst of the chaos. You're so mad about feeling alone that you didn't realize that he was there with you in the midst of your loneliness. And so today God is trying to show you, I've been with you. And you've been dealing with doubt to the point where because of your false expectations of who God is, you tried to make God into who you wanted him to be. And because he didn't bend to who you wanted him to be, when he didn't show up the way you wanted him to show up, you felt like he left you for dead. God says, I am the sovereign God and I'm with you and I'm for you right now. Don't doubt me now. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and even right now, you're struggling with doubt. Man, if I go up there, is anything really going to happen? Yes. For whom the Son sets free, it's free indeed. If anyone, if anyone, anyone would confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, he will save you from the very grips of hell. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to die, that whosoever will believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God is saying, don't doubt me now. If you're here this morning and you realize, I can't carry on with this doubt. This doubt is going to send me to an early grave and will ultimately lead me to a place called hell where I'll be eternally separated from you. If you're here this morning, and you don't only just want God to deal with your doubt, but you want him to deal with your sin. And you want to come with a repentant heart and be washed clean. It's freshly fallen snow. This is your opportunity. Can you just lift your hand this morning and say, it's me. It's me. It's me standing in the need of prayer. Come on, lift it. Just lift one hand. I can't tell if you're worshiping or if you're lifting your hand. If that's you, just lift one hand in the air and say, that was me. You're talking hallelujah. There's one. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Heaven just grew. Heaven just grew. Here's what I'm going to do. It's a long walk. I'll meet you. There goes two. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Don't doubt me now. Don't doubt me now. We're going to deal with this now. It may feel like a long walk, but this is the best walk you could ever take in your life. I'm not going to put the microphone in your hand. I'm not going to ask you to turn to the congregation to say anything. I just want to come up here and pray that you would receive Jesus Christ. Could you come out of your seat and join me here at this altar? We're going to celebrate you as we come. We're going to celebrate you as we come. We're going to celebrate you as you come. Come on, sis. One foot in front of the other. One foot in front of the other. Hallelujah. Come on, you can stand right here. Hallelujah. Now, is that you? Come on, sis. Come on, sis. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 No more standing at the tomb weeping he is risen 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 that you may have life and have it abundantly to every head bowed and every eye closed y'all gotta recognize how many prayers have gone into this moment how many generations i believe every time somebody gets saved is somebody from way down the lineage that have been praying for this very very moment hallelujah it's a big deal grandma's prayers grandmama's prayers great grandmama's prayers for this moment hallelujah i'm going to begin to pray 
And if it's you that needs to be up here and you feel it, your feet want to move, but your brain is saying, stay right here. We're just, we just going to go out and celebrate mama after this. Just chill. Let the moment pass. I won't let it be awkward just for a little bit. Fight it. Fight it. Fight it. God is dealing with your doubt. He's dealing with that doubt. He is a risen Savior. I'm going to begin to pray. And as I'm praying, if that's you, don't feel like you're going to interrupt anything. You come right on up here and join us. We're going to pray. Those of you here at this altar, can you just lift your hands like this? It's important. This means I surrender. It means I surrender. I'm letting go of everything I need to let go of, and I'm receiving everything that I've come to receive. And we all going to pray this prayer together because, no, there is not one that is perfect, but we are all in need of an all-sufficient Savior. So let us pray together. Father, thank you for this moment. I thank you that I have the opportunity to repent of all of my sin. I realize, Lord, I've struggled with doubt. I've had moments where I felt like you left me, or maybe even that you weren't even real. But in this moment, I realize you are real and you never left me. And Lord, I'm forever grateful. Lord, right now, I turn away from a life of sin and I run to your righteous, outstretched hand. I repent, Lord. Wash me clean as freshly fallen snow. Lord, I believe that you suffered, that you died and were buried. And on the third day, you rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures and you ascended into heaven and you're praying for me and you've given me the gift of your Holy Spirit to lead me, to love me, to correct me, to empower me. I receive that gift. Fill me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Lord, in this moment, you are mine. And finally, I am yours in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord a shout of praise. This is Miss Mary. This is Rosa. They just want to put a Bible in your hand and pray for you. They're going to tell you what your next steps are. They won't hold you long at all. Heaven just grew. Hell just lost another one. Hell just lost another one. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let me formally dismiss for you all. Solomon, you got a word? He's going to dismiss. Well, let me just do this. <laughs> every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Lord, for everyone that has struggled with doubt, we thank you for the opportunity that we had to be real and to come to you and say, yeah, I struggled in this area and know that you know how to deal with our doubt. You were faithful to heal us you are faithful to fix the marriage. You are faithful to fix the marriage. You're faithful to fix things in the workplace. You're able to fix things in the workplace. You can do it in our community. Lord God, we won't limit you, but we come to you in a real way to say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. We thank you, O oh God, for breaking the pattern of doubt in our lives. We move forward in faith, O oh Father God, that can move mountains. We love you and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. God bless you, family. Enjoy mamas, aunties, grandma, mentors. Enjoy your day. God bless you. I will see you next week.